physics education, electrical engineering education, and quantum optics. We're going to have a session now that is uh, focused on quantum information science and the common way trial of physics. We're going to have three talks on, uh, on those subjects. And our first speaker is Kat Gillen from uh, Cal Poly at San Luis Obispo, and she will tell us about quantum computing with atoms and light. We'll see you. for inviting me. I definitely appreciate the opportunity to speak here today. Uh, indeed, I'm Kat Gillen. I'm in the physics department at Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo. And uh, if you don't know yet where that is, if I've talked to you, I've told you, but if you don't yet know where that is, it's about halfway between LA and San Francisco on the beautiful central coast of California. Uh, it's quite a nice place you should visit. Uh, if you don't want to make that your destination, people that take the scenic route from LA to San Francisco often stop in there. So I just wanted to recommend that. Um, Cal Poly, the university uh, itself, is pretty big. Uh, over 20,000 students, uh, mostly undergraduates, uh, about 1,300 faculty members altogether. And in the physics department, uh, that's actually also pretty big. Uh, we have about 45 faculty members, and uh, these days roughly 200 students or so. So a uh, pretty big department uh, as well. And uh, today I'll be talking to you a little bit about the work that we're doing there in the field of neutral atom quantum computing, so trying to do quantum computing using atoms and light. Uh, first, I'll give you the very briefest of introductions to quantum computing. Uh, tell you, you know, what it's based on, how it works, and what it takes to make a quantum computer. And then I will also tell you about how to trap atoms with light, uh, because uh, creating a light pattern to trap atoms for neutral atom quantum computing is, in fact, uh, the main focus of my work. Um, good. <coughs> All right, so uh, the reason people would like to build a quantum computer is that they are already known to be able to do certain things that any classical computer, even a supercomputer, could never achieve. And by never, I mean in the age of the universe or something like that. Okay. Um, and so, so some of the, <laughs> so there you go. Um, some of the prime examples, the most important examples are if you were to build a quantum computer, it could crack the most common encryption system in use today, the so-called RSA system. Um, so that would be good if you have the computer, bad if you're not the one that has the computer. Um, and then if you're, you know, not so interested in these like sneaky things, uh, there's also a big uh, science application which is in simulating quantum systems. So as you make the simulated system bigger and bigger, it becomes impossible to do on a classical computer, but a quantum computer is a quantum system, so if you tune it up right, you can just let it go and uh, see how this quantum system develops. Uh, why can we do things that you can't do with a classical computer? That is because in quantum systems, so with very few exceptions, those are usually very small systems like single atoms, few atoms, or electrons, <laughs> photons, what have you. Um, things can happen that we've never seen in a macroscopic world. Okay? Quantum mechanics allows certain things that are big no-no in our everyday macroscopic experience. Uh, the first of those two phenomena is superposition. So in your usual classical computer, like the one that you have in your pocket right now, uh, we know that there's a very large number of bits in it, each of which uh, will be able to have one of two states, which we usually call 0 and 1. So the bit can be either in 0 or 1. Well, quantum mechanics actually allows these small items to be in two states at once. Two or in fact more states at once, but we're going to, in this discussion, uh, stick to two. So the, a quantum bit or short qubit can be both in zero and one at the same time. So you can see how that could open up some possibilities that you wouldn't have otherwise had. And the way we express that mathematically is, uh, one of the ways is to show the wave function of our quantum bit. and. Um, these zero and ones and these weird brackets here are the quantum states zero and one. 
and uh, then a qubit can be in any superposition of the two where a and b are just some complex numbers. So you can be uh, more in one than in zero. You can have any combination of zero and one uh, for your qubit. Then the second interesting phenomenon that you see in the quantum world um, is entanglement. So to explain that, I'm going to start you off with a pair of qubits that's not entangled. Okay, we'll start there. Um, so let's say I have two qubits that I'm going to call A and B. And they're not entangled. They're just here run of the mill, mill quantum bits right now. And I'll go ahead and keep A with me and send B to the opposite end of the universe. Okay? And just as an example, let's say each of these quantum bits was placed in the equal superposition of 0 and 1. And so the way you then describe such a combined system of two qubits uh, with a wave function is you can write it as the product of the state of A times the state of B, like I did here. Now let's see what happens. Okay, again, these are not entangled. Let's just see what happens. If I go ahead and make a change to A, the one that I kept, uh, in my example, I'm deciding to go ahead and measure A in a 0 and 1 basis. Okay, what that means is that uh, with some likelihood when I measure this kind of state, this equal superposition here, uh, basically this superposition that you're seeing, um, you can never directly observe that. That's one of the uh, drawbacks of quantum mechanics. Okay, so the, the thing is in a superposition state, um, but you can't directly measure that. When you try to measure your qubit, what will come out is either 0 or 1. But you can then do a few things to infer that, in fact, it must have been in uh, the superposition of the two. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, make a measurement. And so that measurement will go ahead and collapse this uh, wave function into one of the states, in my case, with equal likelihood. And I chose that, let's say, it collapsed to state 1. Okay? I got outcome 1 when I measured this. Then the new combined qubit state looks like this. So if we now... Uh, observe the function for B, we notice that's actually identical to what it was a minute ago before I did my measurement. So I changed A, and nothing happened to B. That's kind of normal. So if I did that with my classical bits, that would have been the same thing, right? That's normal. Uh, it would take 15 billion years for light to travel from one to the other. So you know, even if there's an interaction between the two, B wouldn't know about this for a very long time. So perfectly normal. Now let's try the same thing with two entangled qubits. Okay? To get qubits entangled uh, is often pretty tricky, but basically uh, they usually have to be together or together-ish, and you have to do something to them to connect them in this way, to entangle them. Let's say I've done that, and now I go ahead and keep A and send B to the other end of the universe. And as an example, I picked this state right here, uh, which is entangled. The way you can tell it's entangled is, see how I didn't write it as something A times something B? I couldn't do that. Uh, A and B are mixed in this term and also in this term. Try as you might, even with some mathematical shenanigans and, and shenanigans and so on, you can't factor out all the B, A stuff and all the B stuff. It's not possible. This is one of the ways you can know that a state is entangled. Okay. So now let's do the same thing again. So if I make a change to A, indeed I'm going to once again measure A and see which outcome I get. Uh, let's see what happens. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead and measure this. And you can't quite write, I, can't, I don't have the state of A in here. It's like all mixed in. But you do see that there's two options this can collapse into, uh, each of which are equally likely, and one option has A in state 0 and one option has A in state 1. So still, those are the two options I'm going to get in my measurement of A. So I'll carry out that measurement, and let's say again, I happen to get outcome 1. Okay. Well, that means that our wave function has collapsed to this portion of the state. Now compare. Uh, before I did this, if somebody, say, I sent somebody with B to go to the end of the universe, um, if they were here were to make a measurement of B, they might get 0 or 1 out when they do that. But after I've messed with A, after I measured A and this happened, they would for sure get 1 out. So even though I couldn't write the state of B here directly because it's entangled, uh, we see there used to be two options, and now there's only one. So clearly, 
something did happen, even though these two have no way of communicating with each other in any reasonable time frame. And so that's the nature of entanglement. Uh, they're connected, they're now one system, so even if they're far away and they can't talk to each other, they're one system, you change one, something happens to the other. And so that phenomenon is being utilized in uh, quantum algorithms to do things that a classical computer couldn't do, at least not in that time frame. All right, so those are the principles we're going to use. Now the question is, how do we build a quantum computer? That's what we're after. How do we do it? And so... In its most basic form, people have identified about five things that your computer should be able to do. Okay? And it's kept very, very general. You need some sort of scalable system of qubits. So you need to identify two states in your quantum system that you can use as your zero and one. And you need to be able to have lots of these qubits in some usable form. So some way where you can address individual qubits or something like that. Okay, and uh, the magic number, well, the, the numbers vary, but we think we need roughly, give or take a few orders of magnitude, roughly a million qubits uh, to get this show on the road to make a useful quantum computer, so A, useful quantum computer can use, uh, do useful calculations, and B, to be able to um, do error correction, which means as time goes on, bad things will happen to these qubits, so those superposition states that you're seeing, they don't tend to stay like that. There'll be uh, things that accidentally change them, accidentally make them collapse, and so on. Uh, that just can't be prevented. Uh, but um, we can take care of that. If we just have enough qubits to go around, we could take care of that. Uh, then, of course, like with any type of computer, you want to be able to initialize your system to a known state. You need to be able to for perform gates, just like you need to do on your bits in your regular computer. Um, this thing right here is actually related to what I just said about those qubit states don't stay like that forever um, because the environment will sneak in and interact a little bit with your qubit and change the state inadvertently. Uh, and so that's called the decoherence when it happens. And so we want uh, the quantum state to stay uh, the way we wanted it for a really long time so we can hopefully get in lots of quantum operations before something gets accidentally uh, changed. Okay. And then finally, we want uh, to be able to read out the qubit state or at least some property of the qubit state that contains the answer to our question. Okay. So, seems reasonable. Um, and as you see, it's kept very, very general. And so, right as we speak, people are in the progress of trying to make this happen, get all these different aspects going at the same time in a quantum computer. And in fact, people ex are exploring many different fields uh, many different types of qubits and interactions to see if they can build a quantum computer. In fact, uh, some people are trying to combine different systems because they all have advantages and disadvantages to make one fully uh, functional system to accomplish that. So here's a list. It's uh, actually already a little outdated, and it's also not complete, but that's what I could reasonably fit on this slide. Um, just to make you, you don't need to read the whole thing, but just to make you appreciate just how many very different types of uh, systems people are exploring to try and make a quantum computer. Okay, so um, I'm going to concentrate today on neutral atoms and light patterns because that's the area that I'm personally working in, but there are many others. In fact, you're going to learn a little bit about ions and uh, doing quantum information with them in the uh, next talk. So then in neutral atoms, the way these things are done is the qubit states are usually chosen to be uh, somewhere in the ground states of the atom, so ground states plural. Uh, so that's a nice thing. Atoms have multiple ground states, so both 0 and 1 can be down there so that they don't decay on their own. Um, however, things can happen to them to still lead to decoherence, but naturally, neutral, basically, if you're wondering, these different approaches, they're all good at one thing and bad at another. Atoms are really good at this thing right here. Okay? They don't naturally interact very strongly with the environment. Okay? However, that also made this thing really, really, really hard because there you're trying to make them interact. So that took a while, but people totally figured this out, so um, it's all good. So all these things, initializing, performing the gates, and even the readout, that's usually done with laser beams shown on the uh, atoms. So um, you know very well if you send in a photon that matches or roughly matches the energy difference between states in the atom that can change a state. And so by this mechanism, we can manipulate the states and even do two qubit gates and so on. Um, so really, um, 
the techniques are not unlike the kinds of things we use in laser spectroscopy. So it was a very well-established technique when people were starting to try to make neutral atom quantum computers. Okay. Um, and then the tricky part that remains for people is to generate a scalable system of qubits. Um, basically, trying to get them all into a big array where you can talk to them individually, that's been a little bit tricky. And so that is the area that I'm working in, and I'll tell you uh, more about it and how we're trying to solve that problem in a moment. So now I want to move on to how we trap atoms with light. So um, that first step, getting a scale of the system of qubits, the name of the game is make a light pattern that traps the atoms in such a way that you can then go in uh, with a laser beam and do uh, single qubit gates, two qubit gates, what have you. Okay, and so let me first briefly address how we trap atoms with light. Um, atoms, as you all very well know, have a positive core, positively charged core, and then a, a negatively charged electron cloud around it. So there's positive and a negative electric charges in it. So when you place something like that in an electric field, such as a laser beam, for example, or a light pattern made uh, with a laser, uh, then that will move the charges just a little bit from their natural positions and it will, in fact, induce an electric dipole moment in the atom. So now you have an electric dipole in an electric field. And as you all know, um, an electric dipole force is going to be exerted on that, uh, which in its familiar form would look kind of like this, where this is the dipole moment, this is the electric field. I'm going to go ahead and rewrite this exact formula just a slightly different way. Okay, um, which is more useful in when we're creating the light pattern. This will tell us more easily what exactly is happening to the atom. Um, when you look at this expression, uh, so h bar, well, that's Planck's constant right here, and then the gamma and the saturation intensity i, all of those are constants that depend on the type of atom you're using and which transition in the atom that you're using. Uh, so those are just some constants. And then the important things for what I'm trying to explain are the intensity, which if you're trying to generate a trap, uh, you'll see in a moment that we're going to want an intensity that actually changes with position. And then there's this laser detuning right here, which I'm going to explain on the next slide. All right. So uh, the laser detuning is this, where omega L is the angular frequency of the laser light that you're using. And then omega A here is actually the atomic resonance frequency. Uh, what that is, let's say these are two states in the atom. Uh, and they have some energy difference delta E. Then omega A is the corresponding angular frequency based on this formula right here. So it's a measure of the difference in energies in the, in the atom. Um, good. And so what we see now is, so we're trying to make an atom trap. What we can see now, let's say if omega L is larger than omega A. We call that blue detuning because the blue end of the rainbow is the one with the high frequency. So in the field, we see blue detuning. So if that's the case, we see delta is a positive number. So now if we're trying to trap atoms, what we'd like to do is have um, a potential energy well that's confined in all directions. So we want low potential energy surrounded by high potential energy. Okay? So if delta is a positive number, so now all this stuff right here is some positive number, then we see that that occurs if uh, basically we have a low light intensity surrounded in all directions by high intensity, right? So then that, that low light center or no light center has zero or very low potential energy, and then in all directions the potential energy goes up, basically creating a cage for our atom. Okay? So if we tune our laser to a higher frequency than the resonance of the atom, then um, we can trap atoms at dark spots that are surrounded by light. And then conversely, imagine we just tune our laser a little bit lower than the uh, atomic resonance. Then delta is now negative. So now low potential energy would be where there's lots of light because the whole thing is going to be really, really negative. Okay? And so because of that, uh, you're now trapping atoms at bright spots. So if you have a bright spot that's surrounded by darkness or a little less brightness, then in effect, again, you have a, a potential energy well that the atom is stuck and you have an atom trap. So 
uh, by choosing our laser detuning, we can make it so that ions are tra uh, trapped either at localized dark spots or localized bright spots. So now to make our quantum computer, what we want to do is we want to somehow generate an array of bright spots or dark spots, uh, then load one atom into each of these, and then those are our atomic qubits for our quantum computer. Here are some examples of light traps. So people have successfully trapped atoms with lights. They, they might be doing so as we speak right now in this building. Um, so they have done it, but let me just introduce to you a few patterns and then show you what the kind of issues are that we're trying to solve with our research at Cal Poly. Uh, the probably simplest geometry for a light trap are optical tweezers, where you have just one laser beam that's focused down really, really tightly. That focus is going to have a higher intensity than uh, the surrounding areas in all directions, including the axial direction. And so, to me, that's an atom trap. Okay, that's a ready tuned atom trap right there. So you can trap atoms in it. Um, those are usually so nice and big, you can trap other things like little uh, microspheres and attach things to them or um, little microbes and stuff like that. So people use it in bio biophysics as well. There's other areas where they use it in, but in particular, you can trap atoms with this kind of thing. Uh, then there are optical lattices. So imagine you're taking pairs of laser beams for in uh, counter-propagating laser beams in all three directions of space. Then each pair of these laser beams is going to generate a staining wave. So you'll have nodes and anti-nodes, which here translates to brightness and darkness. So I don't know how your 3D visualization is, but you know, imagine um, you know, one pair of laser beams, you have these like bright slices and dark slices, and send in a pair of laser beams in the second direction, you'll have bright and dark like cylinders, basically, and then send in a pair in a third direction, and all of a sudden you have this cube of bright and dark spots, uh, each of which is confined in all three dimensions. Okay? Um, so that would be a so-called 3D optical lattice. Um, that's already a very popular candidate for uh, quantum computing, for neutral atom quantum computing, because there, uh, with very little work, you can make a system that easily has one million or more trap sites that you can put your atoms in. The issue, however, is if we're trying to do our quantum information, uh, sorry, our quantum operations with laser beams coming in, um, let's say you're trying to do something to the atom that's right in the middle, you have to send in your laser beam and talk to that atom without disturbing any of the other atoms along the way. And that's, people are trying to make it so, but it's a little tricky, because you're still, you're for sure gonna hit these other atoms and you have to deal with that. Okay, and so the 3D structure is kind of a issue there. So one obvious solution to that is if we made a two-dimensional array of atoms, then we are free to come in from that third dimension with our laser beams and talk to the qubits that we want without, if they are far enough apart and our laser is focused tightly enough, without much interfering with or messing with the uh, uh, neighboring atoms, okay? And so one su such suggestion was to basically make a whole bunch of little optical tweezers uh, in this 2D array by using a microlens array and shining light in it, and then each lens basically makes a little optical tweezer, and then the focus of each of them is a trap site where we can put one atom to serve as our atomic qubit. Um, the limitation, one of the limitations of that is that that only works with bright spots, which in principle isn't a problem, but if the atoms are trapped where there's lots of light, that actually makes it more likely for the atoms to accidentally absorb a photon from the trap light, which is not our intention, right? That's not the, the one manipulating the state of the atom. That's just supposed to hold the atom. So when, when the atoms are trapped in brightness, that's just a little more likely. So it makes our coherence times shorter. Okay. Another approach that actually uh, geometry-wise does, doesn't look too unsimilar to this, you take a whole bunch of Gaussian laser beams, so basically normal looking focused laser beams, um, but much closer together than what they did in this um, geometry here. If you bring them really close together, then um, these four uh, laser beams in the square right here, right in the middle of them, an atom trap forms. So uh, this pattern you're seeing here, each of these peaks is actually, this is a potential energy profile, and then each of these peaks is actually uh, one Gaussian laser beam, and then we see there's these dips right in the middle between, you know, the square of four laser beams, and they make 
decent atom traps. And so there, atoms are trapped in areas that are darker. Not completely dark, but darker. Okay. And then the approach that we're uh, taking at Cal Poly is um, we discovered that you can trap atoms in a diffraction pattern behind a pinhole. I'll show you that in a moment. And so um, if you make a 2D array of pinholes, then you can trap atoms uh, in the pattern behind that. And those pinhole patterns, they have bright spots and dark spots available. So we can choose if we want to, to trap them at bright spots or dark spots. So it's a very versatile uh, pattern in that sense. Okay, so with that, I'm now ready to tell you about my work that I'm doing at uh, Cal Poly with my students. All right, so the atom traps that we're trying to make, they're actually very easy to make. It's much harder to put atoms in them, but to make is very, very easy. You've, all, you've probably all done it, to be honest. Um, so we shine a laser onto a pinhole, so a circular aperture, and if that's, you know, just a little bit bigger, but not too much bigger than the laser wavelength, then uh, we know that a diffraction pattern forms. Most of you have probably seen that. So if I um, you know, shine a laser through a circular aperture and then put a screen behind it, what you're going to see is a uh, bright circle in the middle, and then like a bright you know, plate, like filled out circle in the middle, and then a dark ring and then a bright ring, and then a dark ring. Does that sound familiar? And then if you move the screen further away, then the pattern will keep looking pretty much like that, except maybe it'll start getting a little bit bigger as you go. So now look at that same pattern that you've probably observed uh, as an atomic physicist or a cold atom physicist, and you'll see that uh, that bright sort of cylinder in the center, that is an atom trap. And it's very good in the two radial dimensions, but it's really bad in the third dimension, okay? Like the V direction there, uh, there's hardly any trapping. The atoms could basically be in there and then move around freely along the Z direction. So that's not a very good tra trap for quantum computing because you're trying to really reach your atom, and so if it's not where you're pointing, then that's kind of a bad thing. Um, so that's not good, but it turns out that really, really close to the aperture, um, a um, much more crazy pattern forms. To uh, explain what I mean by close is so you're aware of the Fraunhofer diffraction regime, which is usually also called far field. Then there's the Fresnel diffraction regime. When you get a little closer, you have to be more careful. Um, and that's also called near field sometimes. And so this area that's interesting, so I'm not aware of a name for it, so I call it just interesting area so far. Um, <laughs> this interesting area happens even closer than that to the pinhole. Okay, um, and yes, so what, what's shown here is actually a cut through the diffraction pattern along the YZ plane. So to fully appreciate this pattern, what you want to do in your head is take this and uh, kind of spin it around its axis. So it's cylindrically symmetric. So imagine this spinning around its axis to get the full 3D pattern. And so we see right here that we have a bright spot that, imagine, of spinning this whole graph around to get the full 3D graph that's um, surrounded by darkness in all directions. Okay? And so that makes, as we calculated, actually a pretty decent bright st spot trap for an atom. And similarly, this right here can serve as a dark spot trap. It's darkness surrounded by light in all directions that can be a dark spot trap. And the center of this is, in fact, dark, like no light, which is good for you know, coherence issues. Uh, also, each of these makes a trap as well. They're just smaller, but those are all potential traps that we use. Good. So how would we use that for quantum computing then? The plan would be to go ahead and make an array of pinholes. Shown here is a three by three array, but we're thinking more like a thousand by a thousand. That makes a million, right? So, uh, but uh, just as an example, here it is. Uh, I've added a little a uh, new aspect in this picture here, you see we actually, instead of sending one laser beam through, we're sending in two laser beams at an angle. And so then uh, each pin will form this diffraction pattern that you saw just at a slight angle uh, for each of the laser beams. So actually each pin would then have two trap sites. And then we uh, put atoms into each trap site. So depending on laser detuning, we choose a bright spot or a dark spot or something like that. Um, cool. And now let's do some quantum computing with these. 
So if I now want to do a single qubit gate or initialize the state of a certain qubit or read it out or something like that, because this is now a two-dimensional array, I'm free to now send in a laser beam from the third dimension to uh, communicate with it. Okay. And uh, if I just choose, basically we get to choose the distance between the pinholes. And so we can just make them uh, comfortably far apart so that we know we can focus our laser beam down enough so it addresses only the qubit that we want to reach and not the neighbors. Okay. And you know, also tilt the lasers far enough so that um, we can address only one but not its neighbors. And for a two qubit gate, uh, what we might consider doing uh, is optional, okay? It's optional, but uh, it might help. It's we can move the laser beams together and overlap the pair of depths. So let's say I want to entangle these two qubits right here, for, for example. Right, so we can tilt the laser beams so that they now fully overlap. The closer the qubits are, the faster those two qubit gates are going to go. Then we send in our laser beam sequence that entangles the two qubits. And then when we're done, we just pull them back apart, and now we have these two qubits entangled. And then let's say I, want to, I really want to entangle this qubit with that qubit. Okay? Uh, what we can then do is we can tilt the laser beams further, I'm going to stay like this, further apart, and so then overlap this one with this one, and then send in some laser beams to entangle those two with each other, or kind of pass on that entanglement from this. Uh, to this and so on. And so we could in principle, while this may not be the most efficient way, in principle we could reach any uh, qubit in that array and uh, create whatever quantum operations that we want to achieve. Okay? So that's our idea of how we might help make a neutral atom quantum computer. So now let me switch to sort of the experimental work that we're doing in our lab. So whenever you're trying to trap atoms with light, uh, you can't do that straight up, okay? Or at least with our light traps, you certainly can't do that straight up because straight up uh, we use rubidium atoms in our experiment, and so at room temperature, they're already going over 100 miles an hour. So it'll be very hard to make a light trap that's you know, strong enough to stop that and catch it and keep it. Um, so usually with these experiments, or always with these experiments, you have to pre-cool the atoms, uh, slow them down so that you can then catch them in those light traps. And so usually what's used for that is a so-called magneto-optical trap, uh, where we send in laser beams uh, from all three directions of space. Again, it's actually two laser beams, one in each direction. Okay, these are counter-propagating laser beams in all directions. And so if tuned properly, these laser beams will slow down the atoms. Wherever they're headed, they're going to slow down the atoms. Uh, combine that with the magnetic field of a pair of electromagnets, uh, we can make the atoms collect in a little cloud right at the center of that magnetic field. Okay, so now we have this little ball of atoms that are now going a few centimeters a second. Those we can catch, we think. Okay, those we can catch. And I've just captured down here a moment in history in our lab. So it took, it, I started in 2006 at Cal Poly. So it took us five years to get the mod working, okay? But we did, we did. Uh, we didn't have a way to capture frames with the computer at the time. So we took a photograph of the video screen that was showing the camera of it. But, I mean, and so you can barely, we circled it because you can barely see it, but there's a little bit of a bright spot here that's not here. Those are the trapped atoms, okay? So you can barely see it, but we were so excited. We were high-fiving each other and everything like that. It's a very, very exciting moment, okay? So if you haven't experienced that, uh, try it out. It's really, really awesome, okay? Uh, good, so we have our mod working, and so then what we're working on right now is try to take those atoms from the mod and transfer those to our um, pinhole traps. Uh, first, for that, so there's lots of things we need to accomplish for that. First, uh, we're actually going to, instead of putting the pinhole mask right in there, uh, in our ultra-high vacuum chamber where the mod is forming, we're actually going to project it in there, because uh, if we put the pinhole mask inside, then each time we decide, let's try a different size, or let's try a different pattern, we'd have to break vacuum. And if you've ever worked with ultra-high vacuum, it's something that you really want to avoid at all costs. So. Um, and then the other reason is, if you put the plate in there, we'd be obstructing the mod beam, so the optical access becomes an issue too. So we're actually going to take a single lens and project the pattern into our mod cloud in our vacuum chamber. And that has some advantages too, because by placement of the lens, we can actually influence how big or small the pattern is projected, so we can actually reduce its size, size change its aspect ratio, and so on. So there's actually additional things that we can do 
uh, with this projection. So we need to, you know, get all the optics in place. It's a single lens, so that part wasn't too hard. Um, and then the other thing that we need to accomplish is we need a very carefully timed sequence of um, switching in any, uh, it's not clear that's the right order, but switching off the magnetic optical trap laser beams, switching off the magnetic field of the magnetic optical trap, and then turning on the light from the diffraction traps, from the pinhole traps. Um, and so there's lots of, you know, one of my double E students, electrical engineering students, designed a switch that can turn our mod off really quickly. And then we have acoustic optical modulators and shutters and the like, and they all need to be made to work together to accomplish this. And finally, as you could see, our imaging system wasn't quite so good then, but so we basically needed to beef up our imaging system to detect the atoms and then eventually also characterize the pinhole traps, so do things like uh, measure their so-called trap frequencies, which is one of the properties that tells you how good a trap it is. And so um, we needed to get that up and running, which we did. Um, here's a picture of our various components right here. And so, you know, we had everything uh, ready to go and all together. And then last summer, I had to move my lab <laughs> to a new building. <laughs> so, um, so uh, we took it all apart and put it back together in a new place. And so now this coming summer, I'm hoping we get to try this out. Okay. Um, so then just to um, show you what kind of work my students are doing, it's everything. Okay. So uh, most of the time is spent working with the lasers and setting up the optics, but then a few poor souls also helped me um, ma uh, make the ultra high vacuum system and bake it. They help in the design and construction and troubleshooting of electronics, uh, interfacing all this various equipment with a computer, you know, using lab view and the like, and a variety of um, miscellaneous design tasks and measurement tasks that come up. Of course, there's also computational work calculating the traps and their properties and how useful they are for quantum computing. Um, they get to present their results at uh, various venues, conferences, and so on. Every once in a while, also co-author a paper, uh, which is pretty exciting. Good, so to finish off, I showed you how we can use the diffraction pattern behind a pinhole to trap atoms and how we envision scaling that up to um, an array of pinholes to use for quantum computing. And um, in the future, we want to try out a few more things, other patterns, the limits of this pattern, how small can you make the pinholes, how close together, and so on. And of course, the big thing is achieve the transfer of our pinhole traps. So with that, I want to just acknowledge um, support through the NSF and uh, Office of Naval Research to get this lab running. And I want to acknowledge all of my many, many, many research assistants that put their blood, sweat, and tears into this. And uh, also my collaborators at Cal Poly that are involved in various aspects of this project. And finally, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thanks. <laughs> your very best to stay within the time limits. I should, yeah. I, I, think, uh, I, I think I will be. Five, five minutes before your time's up. Okay. Sure. already mentioned I'm from Denison University which is in Ohio and uh, thank, thank you to the organizers for inviting me I'm very happy to be here and talk to you about our work in, at Denison using ions and photons for quantum information and thanks also to the uh, to Kat for the introduction to quantum computing in the previous talk uh, so I'll just briefly recap what she already said um, which is for quantum information so for information in general, like the information in the bits stored in your phone or your computer, it's a classical bit. So this is classical physics. It's a light switch, right? It's off or it's on. It's a zero or it's a one. Okay? Now we can do the same kind of thing with, with atoms, where we can take, say, two states of the atom, say two electron configurations, call one of those configurations a zero, call another configuration a one. But the great thing about atoms is that they obey quantum mechanics. So we can actually have not just 0 or 1, but we can have 0 and 1 simultaneously. So these superpositions of states then lead to a new range of things that you can do with information. And some of this was already mentioned, so I'll just be very brief here. 
which is we can do things like quantum computation, trying to use this to tackle otherwise intractable computational problems. Um, we can also try to do quantum communication, which is actually trying to send information over long distances in a secure manner based on the principles of quantum mechanics. You can also try to take a well-controlled quantum system and s simulate or mimic an unknown or unwell-controlled system, not well-controlled system. And of course, all of this sort of gets at some of the fundamental aspects of quantum mechanics as well. So the work I'm going to talk about today is focused primarily on the quantum communication aspect, but also impacts all of these other aspects that are up here too. Okay. And as was also mentioned in the previous talk, there are lots of different platforms you can choose to try to implement this with. Um, our choice of platform is using ions and photons. And here we want to use atomic ions as the quantum memory. So we're going to try to write, read, and store information in individual atoms. And we're going to then try to use photons to link together these quantum memories over some distance. So let's first talk about ions. So first, uh, how do we produce atomic ions? There are a couple of ways to do this. Uh, the, these are the three most common methods. Uh, so these are my neutral atoms over here, the yellow balls. And so the first way is electron bombardment. Basically take electrons and slam them in to a neutral atom, and you can kick off an electron, leaving you with a, neg leaving you with a positive ion left over. You can also do photoionization, take laser light. It's on resonance, say, with the transition of the atom that promotes the electron uh, up to the continuum, so it removes it from the atom and, again, leaves you with a positive ion. And the third method is the sort of Star Wars style uh, use of lasers where you take a big laser pulse, some solid substrate, and you just blast it with laser light, and you can get lots of ions this way coming out. Um, and it's actually this last method that we're using right now at Denison to produce our ions because we can get lots of ions this way, and for reasons that hopefully will become clear later in the talk, we'll see why we're interested in having lots of ions to, be, to begin with. All right, so we actually set out first to characterize this ablation method for the ions that we're interested in using. And so we built a time of flight mass spectrometer to do this. Uh, this is what's shown here. And the basic idea here is very simple. We start with a sample, in this case the orange rectangle that's there. We blast it with that laser light that I talked about, and we produce some ions. Now, because of the small potential difference here between these two plates, uh, they get they drift over into a, another region of the mass spectrometer where there's a large potential difference, so they get accelerated to higher energy, um, and then they enter this nominally field-free region, so the ions travel down this drift tube for some time until they reach the other side, where then they get to reach a detector, and then we can detect how long did it take for the atom to get there. And the time it takes for the atom to get there depends on what its mass is. So therefore, we can determine basically what the charge-to-mass ratio is of the ions that we're getting in this ablation process. So if you do this uh, for a number of different substrates, one of the atoms we're interested in is barium. So we tried a couple of different barium substrates. This is the kind of spectra you get out of that. Um, and as you can see, uh, we produce lots of different kinds of ions, but in particular, we also produce lots of barium ions, which is what we want to laser cool and trap. OK, so now that we have the ions, like I said, I want, we want to trap them for use in quantum information. Um, so how do we trap an ion? Uh, so it's a charged particle. So the thing you initially would think to do is, well, I can use electric fields because it's a charge. And the simplest thing you might think to do with a positive charge is to surround it with other positive charges. Therefore, you've got electric fields that all point in. You say, boom, I've got a trap. And unfortunately, though, that doesn't work because the divergence of the electric field in free space is zero, which it's, in other words means that electric fields that come in also have to go out. So if you have an ion here, it can follow one of these electric field lines out, and you don't have a stable trap. So you have to be a little more clever than that. And so the way we do this instead is we make, instead of a static configuration of fields, we make a dynamic configuration of fields. So we instead surround it with positive and negative charges, effectively. So now at any instant in time, it's actually anti-trapping in one direction. So the ion would like to start moving in this direction. But before it gets very far, we switch the electric field direction around so it goes the other way, and now it gets pushed back towards this way and wants to go this way instead. And if you oscillate this very quickly back and forth, in this case at radio frequencies, you can actually form a stable trap. Here's what that sort of generic ion trap looks like. Uh, we've got two electrodes that are oscillating at radio frequencies here. These two rods labeled as RF voltage. So they're oscillating back and forth at radio frequencies. We've got two ground rods as well. And in those two dimensions then formed in the transverse plane here, 
that forms a two-dimensional oscillating potential, which is what's shown up in the upper right-hand corner here that flops back and forth. Okay? The third dimension is just capped using DC static potentials. Okay? And then you can, in principle, trap ions here in the middle of the trap. Uh, the effective potential seen by the atom is going to be harmonic in all three directions. Okay? And that's what's shown down here. But as you can see, at any instant in time, the potential from the RF looks like, kind of like a horse saddle, right? So it's anti-trapping in one direction. If you were to set a ball there in the middle, it would roll off the side, right? Um, at any instant in time, if you were to freeze it. And this actually leads to a good mechanical analogy for what this trap looks like. So you can actually take something that looks like a horse saddle, and now we can't just manipulate it. I suppose you could, but in this, you, another way to do this is you can actually spin it. And then if you take that horse saddle spinning, and you take something like a metal ball, for example, and set it in the middle, it actually stays there instead of rolling off the side. And so you can actually trap mechanically things this way as well. Now, uh, so this is a macroscopic version of what an ion trap does and a mechanical version. You can also do a macroscopic electric version, which is shown here. Uh, so you can take actually individual dust particles. This is cornstarch in this case that's been charged and is trapped in a large trap. It's a little hard to see in this picture, but you can see there are four rods here as well. Basically the exact same generic ion trap design I showed just two slides ago. And this is the same kind of slide that we're implementing for atomic ions, uh, which is what's shown here. That's slightly smaller now, now we're talking millimeter scale. Um, but again, we have two RF rods. The other two are recessed in this picture behind the two that you can see. Here's our ablation target that we're hitting with our pulse laser. And then in the middle, we can trap clouds of ions. And that's what's shown here is a cloud of barium ions trapped uh, in vacuum. Okay, so now we've got trapped ions. And we'd also like to laser cool them to make them more well controlled, addressable, less decoherence, all these things that were talked about in the previous talk as well about what you would like to have your qubits be in order to make them well controlled for quantum information purposes. So the next thing we'd like to do then is laser cool this cloud and how we do, and we do that using Doppler cooling. And the basic idea here is you tune a laser just shy of a resonance in the atom between the ground and an excited state. So as I've shown you, the energy of this laser that's incident on, this is my ion now in this case, um, is not quite enough energy to make the transition between the ground and excited state. And due to the Doppler effect, if the atom is moving away from the laser light, it actually gets red shifted to longer wavelengths, lower energy, so it's even further away from this resonance, so it doesn't really absorb or scatter any of the light. But as it moves towards the laser beam, it actually gets blue shifted. And if you do this right, you can have it so that it's blue shifts onto resonance, and therefore it scatters light. And every time it scatters a photon of light or scatters a little bit of gets a little kick in momentum in the direction of light, which, as you'll notice in this case, is now opposite to the direction of the motion of the atom. So you're removing energy from the atom, you're slowing it down. Okay? And if we put this in a trap, now this happens continuously. So the atom moves back and forth in a harmonic trap, like the kind I just presented a couple of slides ago, and is continuously being slowed down, or cooled in this case, and this allows us to get to very cold temperatures. The limit here is Doppler cooling is set by this equation, but the typical kind of temperatures we're talking about are in the order of sort of like half of a millikelvin. So you're just a fraction of a degree above absolute zero. This is unimaginably cold, right? So these atoms are moving at incredibly slow speeds, very, very cold. And that's the kind of situation we want to make them well controlled for quantum information purposes. Okay, so I mentioned that one of the atoms that we're interested in is barium. Uh, the scheme then for laser cooling and trapping barium looks very similar to the sort of generic scheme here. Slightly more complicated by the fact that barium has a third level in it, which is this low-lying D state, this 2D3 half state. So we actually need two lasers instead of one in order to effectively, efficiently laser cool it. So we have light both at 650 nanometers and at 494 nanometers in order to cool it. And I was happy to see barium appear in an earlier talk this morning as well. So, um, and the way we do this, we generate this light from external cavity diode lasers that are custom external cavity diode lasers we built in the lab. Uh, the 650 light comes directly from one of these lasers. The 494, the blue light, comes from taking 987 light from an external cavity diode laser and then doubling it in a custom second harmonic generation cavity uh, to produce the light necessary to drive this S1 half to P1 half transition. But combined then, that allows us to laser cool and trap barium. So we've done this, but the next thing we want to do now is actually want to store information in the barium atom. And 
In principle, you could actually use this level configuration uh, to do that and just two, pick two levels, call one of them a zero and call one of them a one. In order to preserve the coherence and for a variety of other reasons, we actually want to work with the odd isotope of barium, which has hyperfine structure because it has nuclear spin. So the cooling scheme then gets slightly more complicated. Uh, so we need additional colors or additional frequencies there to depopulate all of the additional hyperfine levels that appear in the atom. But you can do this by modulating the laser light using electro-optic modulators and other things. And then now we can actually pick two levels in the atom and call one of them a zero, say, and one of them a one. You could use your bottom states here and the ground state as your qubit. You can actually even use the long-lived metastable D state. You can pick two of those levels and call one a zero and one of them a one. And it actually doesn't really matter which you choose. There are advantages and disadvantages to which choice you have in this case uh, for picking them as your qubit. And actually going forward for both this reason, that we have multiple choices, but also because of reasons that will become clear at the end of the talk, I want to generalize the next several slides to then just sort of a very generic hyperfine qubit. Okay? So that's what's shown here. So I'm taking either of those ground state levels or the D state levels um, or some other levels. In, the, in the, the sort of like stable state in the bottom, I'm going to use that as my qubit. Call one of them a zero. Call one of them a one. They're separated by some number of gigahertz. And we're going to assume that they're coupled to an excited state up here that we can couple to using laser light. And in particular, I want to pick two levels where one of the levels, say the top one, is only connected by selection rules in the atom so that it only decays back to the one state, whereas the other state we're going to allow to decay to either 0 or 1. Okay? And you could, there are different configurations in barium, for example, for which you could choose this. Okay, so we're going to use this generic hyperfine qubit. Now I want to talk about how to manipulate information in it. So we can write information in actually using microwaves or RF frequency. So you put microwave radiation on the atom, and you can actually directly drive the transition between hyperfine levels in an atom. Uh, the data that's shown here is not for barium. We have not yet implemented this in barium at Denison. So this is data from a terbium that's before. Before I came to Denison, I worked with the terbium. Um, but it shows how you, can how you can rotate the atom between these two states, 0 and 1, very effectively using microwave radiation. We can also, in principle, read out the state of the atom, then, using laser light. Basically, we shine laser light on the atom that will be resonant with the 1 state, with this upper level, which I said only decays back to 1, so that if the atom is in the state 1 when we shine on that laser light. It'll scatter lots of photons, and the atom will appear bright. So you simply count how many photons you get from the atom. You see that it looks bright, and then you know the atom was in the state 1. Conversely, if the atom was initially in the state 0, you shine on that exact same laser light. It's no longer on resonance because of the hyperfine splitting. It's now off resonance. And so it doesn't scatter the light. It doesn't absorb and re-emit it, and so it looks dark. So by distinguishing between the atom being bright or dark, you can distinguish between whether the atom was a 0 or a 1. And so we can read out the state of the atom. All right. So we now know how we can basically write, read, and store information in individual atoms. So now I want to talk about photons and how to use them to link these, link, in principle, distant quantum memories to one another by establishing entanglement between them for quantum communication and eventually quantum computation purposes as well. So the basic idea here is you start with an atom, or an ion, in a trap. This is my schematic of my ion trap here. Um, and we initialize it to some state, say, 0. Okay? The level scheme is shown over here on the right. Uh, and then we hit it with a pulse of light. So hit it with a laser pulse so that the atom gets excited from the 0 state up to the excited state. But now it's, I'm exciting it to the states where it actually can decay to either 0 or 1. And after some characteristic amount of time, set by the lifetime of that level, it will decay. And when it decays, it emits a single photon. It decays back to either 0 or 1 in the ground state of the atom. But because it has two possible paths for decay here, there are actually two different colors or two different frequencies of light that can come out for that photon. If it, if it decays back to 1, the light appears red, or I should say more red than the other one. These are really both the same color. Okay, they're only separated by the hyperfine splitting by a few gigahertz. So don't, this is not to be confused with the red and blue that's actually being used to laser cool barium. It's either both red, but one slightly more red or slightly more blue than the other. So I hope that's not confusing. Um, so if it decays to 1, the photon had a more red wavelength, or short, 
lower frequency. If it decays to zero, it has a higher frequency or more blue light that comes out. So you end up with an entangled state between the atom and the photon that's zero blue plus one red. If the atom's in state one, photon's red. If the atom's in state zero, photon's blue. Okay? Now we can extend that by taking just two of those systems. So take two different atoms, two different ions, uh, have each of them produce an ion-photon entangled pair, and now you can collect and detect those emitted photons. So we want to collect the photons using lenses, couple them into fibers, mostly for mode cleaning, and then actually interfere and detect those individual photons. And here's where some more of the quantum optics comes in. Um, so if you have two identical photons incident on a beam splitter, there's a quantum interference effect known as Hong Mandel interference, where if you have two identical photons incident on a beam splitter on opposite ports, they always like to leave together. So you'll have two photons going this way and zero going the other way, or two photons going that way and zero going the other way. Now in this case, though, we have something that's slightly different because the photons are actually in a superposition of states. They're in the superposition of blue and red. Not only that, but each is entangled with a separate ion. So we actually get, we actually do have a case where we can have the photons go to opposite sides of the beam splitter. So you can have one photon go to this detector and one photon go to that detector. Sorry, this detector and one photon go to that detector. Um, but only when the photons are in a very particular quantum state. It turns out to be the anti-symmetric state of blue-red minus red-blue. So if we look for these kind of detections and we say, I see one photon here at the same time I see one photon there, we know exactly that they must have been in that quantum state. Now they've been measured and removed from the system. But it leaves the atoms in a very particular quantum state as well, which is an entangled state of 0, 1, minus 1, 0. So we end up with two entangled ions that have never been near each other. They can be arbitrarily far apart in principle that are now entangled and correlated with one another. And this is the idea that we'd like to use for then quantum communication and quantum computation purposes. OK, so this sounds great. And you might be asking, so why not just uh, connect two fibers, <laughs> connect a long fiber, say, from Ohio at Denison University down here in Arizona, and uh, connect two ions together. And boom, we've got a quantum communication network. Um, so it turns out that there, well, there are a number of issues with implementing this. But the one that I want to focus on is the fact that the light needed to go this distance in optical fiber. Okay? And to talk about that, I want to talk about all the different ions that have been used for quantum information purposes. So you can see here, these are the different ions that are laser cooled, trapped, and used for quantum information purposes, and the wavelengths needed to work with them in order to laser cool them. Now, the strongest transition of almost all of the ions on this chart are over here in the ultraviolet or the blue. Okay? And as you may know, uh, that has really high attenuation in optical fiber. So it doesn't transmit well through optical fiber. The attenuation is sort of like greater than 10 dB per kilometer. Okay? So you can't go very far with a single photon in optical fiber. Um, most of these ions, though, also have an auxiliary transition that's not quite as strong, um, but could potentially be used for these purposes over here in what I've been calling the medium sort of attenuation region, uh, where the attenuation in optical fiber is somewhere between like 1 to 10 dB per kilometer. So better, but still not great for quantum communication purposes. Where you'd really like to be is way over here, deeper in the infrared, out in the telecom regime between about, say, 1,300 and 1,600 nanometers, where you have the lowest attenuation in optical fiber and therefore can send light the furthest. And none of these ions satisfy that requirement. So the main thing we'd like to do at Denison, and our main motivation, is actually to add a new ion to this list. We're actually looking to trap a new ion, which is doubly ionized lanthanum, which turns out has its ground to first excited state transitions right in this telecom region, right near 1,400 nanometers. So now hopefully it becomes also clear why I want to generalize to a generic hyperfine qubit earlier, because eventually what we'd like to do is we'd like to play the exact same games, but with a different ion. We want to do this with lanthanum. The atomic physics gets well, maybe slightly more complicated because we have two low-lying D states and two F states. But you can still do the same things we did before in terms of laser cooling and trapping, now using something close to 1,400 nanometers, though, where the attenuation in optical fiber is only 0.35 dB per kilometer. 
Um, in addition, lanthanum has hyperfine structure, so we can still store and manipulate information in the atom in the same way we did before. Picking two different levels in the hyperfine manifold of, the, of one of these ground states and calling one of them a zero and calling one of them a one. Now, one of the issues with that, though, is uh, in order to do both the qubit manipulation and also effectively do laser cooling, we need to know what the hyperfine splitting is in the atom. And it turns out that has not been measured before, which is why I've got question marks here. So that's actually our first task for working with double analyzed lanthanum is trying to measure this hyperfine structure. Um, we're doing that using a technique known as optogalvanic spectroscopy. And if you were at the poster session, we'll have already seen Jesse talk about this. So I'm not going to go into any detail about it, but just saying that we can use optogalvanic in a hollow cathode lamp, a high voltage discharge, to try to measure these transitions. This is a spectrum shown for neutral lanthanum here, but we can do the same kind of things for ions in this lamp as well. And actually, just recently, as in last week, we saw the signal for doubly ionized lanthanum. So we. Hopefully, in the very near future, we'll have both barium and lanthanum in traps at, and laser cooled at Denison. Uh, so with that, I'd like to conclude by thanking the students that have worked with me most recently on this. Uh, Jesse Hanks is here at this conference um, and happy to talk about this work. Also, Amanda Nelson and Patrick Banner, which worked with me very re recently as well. Other students that have worked on this project in the recent past and the funding agencies, the Army Research Office and Research Corporation for funding this work. And of course, Thank you for your attention. University, uh, where they're doing not just ultra cold, but also ultra fast, and perhaps at the same time, I guess we will find out. Thank you so much. Yeah, and I do realize it's just me and my talk that's between you and your lunch. So I promise you, I promise, I'll get you out in 30 minutes, maybe 35. Um, before I start, just one quick announcement. You may have heard that. I'm so excited. It's finally 2017. I've been in, waiting for this year since I started in Salem in 2008 because we do have the total, total solar eclipse coming up, and Salem, as you can see, is right in the center of totality. So um, hotels are pretty much booked out in the region, but if you're still thinking about coming, send me an email, and maybe I can find you some place to, to crash. Not everyone, please. <laughs> Um, I do want to take some time to talk about who we are, what kind of physics we're doing. We're a private liberal arts college in Salem, Oregon, and we have about 1,800 undergrad students, and of those, about 10 to 15 seniors in physics every year. Uh, we have four full-time faculty members, and all of us do research projects that are ongoing, um, externally funded, and involve students as early as their sophomore year, typically. Um, I'm just listing briefly my colleagues, and feel free to talk with me in more detail over lunch if you want to know more um, about their research. And I'll tell you more about my, my research in a moment. Uh, we try to have meaningful research experiences throughout the curriculum, so not just in our research labs. Uh, we do have a full year of senior research, and as part of that, our students give two oral presentations. And one of them is together with a neighboring college so that our students get a more authentic research experience. They also write a thesis. And as I said, we encourage them to work in our labs as early as their sophomore year. Uh, we recently got a very nice grant from the NSF that we call OPTICS, which is this acronym here. And that really allows us to prepare our sophomores and our juniors better and to bridge the gap between the rough and, and robust teaching grade equipment that we use in the intro labs and the very sensitive research equipment that we use in our labs. So uh, this grant allowed us to build a facility that is dedicated to the sophomore and junior lab courses in which students work with research grade equipment, but which is kind of a safe space where it doesn't matter too much if they leave a fingerprint on a nice mirror. Uh, we're also writing modules to support these, these activities. And uh, our modules have these three different types of boxes. Uh, the blue boxes explains very practically how students can align certain things in the lab. Uh, the yellow boxes are placeholders for them to record their data. And then we have these green let's play with it boxes where we encourage students to just tweak the experiment a little bit and just see what happens. And based on the feedback we got from the students, we are revisiting our freshman labs. Um, we're switching from PASCO to the pocket lab. I'm not sure how many of you know this. I just learned about it two weeks ago, maybe. Um, so this sounds very interesting. And then to the Arduino platform. 
Okay, so on to my research. And uh, you saw in the title I have two projects, the ultra-cold and the ultra-fast. And I'll talk a little bit about both of these, kind of give you a little bit of background, what it is we're doing, why we're doing it, and uh, what the current status is. So you see ultra-cold in this title there, and you may wonder how cold is that actually. Uh, I did my PhD in Rochester, New York. And let me tell you, it does get very, very cold. We got a lot of snow there. And we got these beautiful ice storms that coated everything in an inch thick layer of ice. Um, yeah, there's a reason I moved to Oregon. <laughs> um, on the absolute scale, those temperatures are still very close to room temperature. Uh, room temperature is about 300 Kelvin. We got there to 250, 260 Kelvin. So you might say, OK, what's colder than Rochester? It's outer space, right? <laughs> so you have about 3 Kelvin temperature. That's about a hundredth of room temperature. I think we can all agree that's pretty cold. Now, these, small, these atoms um, we're producing are actually a million times colder than that. So we're talking about on the order of a few microkelvin to a few hundred microkelvin. And you all know micro, that's 10 to the minus 6. That's pretty small. But I really like to put this into something that we as humans can understand much more easily, and that's length. Okay. So imagine you start flying from Earth in your little rocket all the way to the moon, to the surface of the moon. And that distance is about 280,000 kilometer, give or take. And imagine as you're flying over, you start with something that has a temperature of 300 Kelvin, room temperature, and you lower that temperature all the way to zero Kelvin as you hit the surface of the moon. Okay. Now these atoms, the temperature of these atoms, these 100 microkelvins, correspond to you driving all that distance up to the last 100 meters. So you would be hovering just 100 meters out of the 384 kilometers. Okay. So I think that really drives it home. And if that is not impressive enough for you, I can tell you all of that happens within a fraction of a second. So order of magnitude, milliseconds. And when you do the calculation, uh, the accelerations are just insane that are acting on these atoms. They're about a million times the acceleration uh, of Earth. And to put that into perspective, human beings, we can tolerate something like maybe 10, maybe 20 G. A million? No way. Okay. So what's the big deal? Um, in this community, when we say cold, what we really mean is slow. Um, and mathematically, you see this relation, right? You can convert a temperature into a speed and back and forth. Um, atoms at room temperature have something like 1,000 meters per second. And just as it is pretty difficult for you to analyze a car on the highway when it's zipping past very quickly, uh, it's, much, it's very difficult for us to understand or analyze these atoms in detail, but it gets much easier at these lower temperatures where they just move around with a few centimeters every second. And that's like a car in the parking lot. So how do we do that? And uh, Kat and Stephen uh, laid some groundwork there, so I, I'll go fairly quickly over this. Uh, imagine you take a laser beam that comes from the left-hand side, and you take some atom, and you tweak the color of that laser beam so that it's in resonant with that atom. So what you can get is an absorption and emission. So in this uh, comic Bohr model of the atom, your atom is in the ground state. It sees a photon of just the right energy. It can absorb it, get into an excited state, and it doesn't stay there forever. It emits the photon and drops back into the ground state. And now it's in the ground state again, so it's ready to absorb another photon, and you have this cycle of absorption and emission. Okay. Now you already see in this in this drawing here, that the direction of these photons is different. And as you go over many, many of these absorption emission cycles, the absorption always happens from one direction, because it comes from the laser. But the emission is in a random direction. So you end up with a net momentum kick in the direction of the laser opposing the atom, so you can slow it down. And to confine these atoms in three dimensions, you need six laser beams all pointing towards the center, just as shown here. And life is a bit more complicated. Uh, you need to have a certain polarization in these lasers. And you need to have a quadrupole magnetic field, which is a field that is zero in the center and then increases linearly outwards. And if you do everything just right, you generate a trapping force that has this dissipative term over here, which comes from the lasers. Right, extracting energy, making them slower, and you have this confining, restoring term that comes from the magnetic field and that pushes everything back in the center. 
And so typical temperatures, as I said, on the order of a few microkelvin to up to a millikelvin, you typically trap something like a few million atoms, depending on the species, and you get densities of up to maybe 10 to the uh, 13 per cubic centimeter. Uh, this is actually pretty dilute. So the density of the air in this room is about seven orders of magnitude higher. Okay? So we're talking about very dilute gases, actually. Okay, so I started in 2008, and in 2009, um, I worked with two students, Garrett and Mark, over the summer. And over the course of the summer, we set up the laser system uh, to cool and trap rubidium, and we set up the vacuum system that you kind of see in the back here, um, a big stainless steel vacuum chamber, and uh, we actually managed to trap our first atoms over here, which was very exciting. Um, so what you see here is a view into the vacuum chamber this beam here that you might see, and there's another one here. Those are the laser beams that are crossing. And then this little blob in the center, those are about a million atoms. Okay. So Kat said she, she got really excited when it happened. We had the same thing, high-fiving. It's, it's really, it's, yeah, you have to do it. Um, we've made some improvements since then. And the biggest one was in August 2015, when I could finally move my lab from the third floor in the building into a newly renovated space in the basement. And that made everything so much happier. The lasers were stable, and um, everything is just, it's just so much happier. Um, we also have some additional tools of how to look at the atoms. So this is just in the upper corner there. This is just looking at the atoms as we did before with the camera. Um, we can look at them with a photodiode. We can look at the spatial distribution. And um, all of this together, uh, allowed us to increase the number of trapped atoms by about a factor of 10. So we have a decent sized cloud at this point. And uh, I'd like to show this photo here. I'm not sure how well you can see it. Um, a former student of mine took that with his cell phone camera just into the vacuum chamber. And this little blip here that I've blown up here, those are actually the 10 million rubidium atoms. And you can see those with your naked eye. Um, if everything is dark and your eyes are well adjusted, you see this little glowing ball of light just hovering in the center. Okay, so where are we going with this? Um, the tools we have in place currently allow us to measure essentially atom numbers, and that's it. But we're also interested in how cold actually are these atoms and how dense are they. And that has something to do with where this project is going. So a standard way to measure this is through absorption images. And the setup is shown over here. So you take a laser beam, you send it through your atomic sample, and you tune it so that it's in resonance. And the atoms can absorb photons out of the laser beam, and then you image the shadow on a CCD camera. And by looking at the shadow, the shape and the size of the shadow, you can conclude something about your atoms. You can measure temperature, and you can measure density. So for this to work, um, we actually need very precise control over stray magnetic fields. And the easiest stray magnetic field you can think of is Earth itself. Right, there's a magnetic field right there. Um, we do have some ion pumps attached to the chamber. Those have magnets. And whatever else is magnetic in the lab um, contributes to them. So we designed these uh, compensation coils that you see as these white rectangles on all three directions around our vacuum chamber. And uh, my students actually spent quite some time last semester building those coils, wrapping those coils. So here's Otilia, um, who's in the uh, corner over there, and uh, Lance, who's a sophomore in that project, just wrapping happily the coils um, in the hallway outside the lab. So thank you. <laughs> and uh, here's the fruit of their labor. Um, so in the top corner, you see these six coils, um, different dimensions just based on the space we have. Um, this is an aluminum U-channel structure that we built, and then the, the wire wrapped around. And uh, then we 3D printed these black pieces that fit snugly inside the, um, the coil itself and have this circular hole in the middle that slides snugly over the vacuum chamber so we can mount them. And uh, uh, we tested the coils for a certain current, what kind of temperatures are we getting, what kind of magnetic fields are we getting. So this is all looking very good, and um, we'll pick up there when we get back to campus in a week or so. Um, we also switched our system control. Um, I was using LabVIEW lab before, and uh, I really don't like it, I have to admit it. I like the idea of LabVIEW, but not LabVIEW itself. <laughs> 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 I 
it's just so messy. So I switched to the Teensy and I'm really excited about it. Um, the Teensy is a microcontroller. It's kind of like an Arduino on steroids, if you know Arduinos. Um, and you can see it over here, so it's really small. It's about yay big. Um, this is our Teensy, set up some electronics, which shape the electronic signals that we need so that we can switch uh, lasers, uh, acousto-optic modulators, shutters, magnetic fields, and so on and so forth. And uh, up there is some data we took that shows that all our sequences um, are working as intended. And uh, limiting the time limitation is about 300 nanoseconds, which is when you send two signals out at the same time, they have a delay of about 300 nanoseconds. Now, everything mod-related happens on the order of milliseconds, so this is plenty for us. Okay? Um, we also spend some time playing with calcium, which is the second species we're interested in and which we have not trapped yet, but hopefully soon. Uh, calcium is a different beast. You need to heat it up to really high temperatures in order to get it into the gas phase. And then it's so fast that you can actually not directly trap it um, with the mod. So people use a thing called a Zeeman slower, and that's essentially just a magnet, uh, very often an electromagnet, that is shaped in a certain way so you get a certain magnetic field. And uh, we didn't want to play with electromagnets because there's a whole bunch of uh, problems attached with them, so we decided to go for permanent magnets. And we 3D printed these structures which allow us to hold the magnets in exactly the right position so that the, uh, all the magnets together generate exactly the magnetic fields um, we need. We also spend some time working on the source. Uh, calcium is located over here in this little container and then is sent through this aperture over here. This is a triangular shaped aperture. And uh, if you just have a big aperture like this and a hot calcium source behind it, your calcium atoms just come out um, with big divergence, and that's pretty nasty. So you want to collimate them. And the way to do that is you put little microcapillaries in there. Um, so these are really just metal tubes. I think it's about 120 or so that you slide in there, and that collimates your atomic beam very nicely. So where is this going? Rubidium and calcium. Um, we're really interested in mo uh, making molecules consisting of rubidium and calcium. And the idea is to pre-cool these two samples, rubidium and calcium, overlap them, and then give them a photon. And that's a process known as photoassociation, which has a certain chance that you actually produce that molecule. And to detect the molecule, we use photoionization that Stephen talked about. So you rip an electron away, you end up with a molecular ion, and then you use time of flight in a detector to identify it. Um, if you see molecular poten potentials, these are these two processes, the photoassociation and the photoionization. If you've never seen this, don't worry about it. Okay. So three of my students last semester started working on uh, reviving an old continuum ND6000 dye laser that came to us with pretty much no documentation. But we got it for free, so, you know. Uh, you see the, the actual dye laser system over here. That's part of it. Um, the heart of that dye laser is this little yellowish thing that you see. That's a glass cell. And we have some tubing attached, and we run a dye solution through the glass cell. And then you pump that dye solution from the back with this quanta ray laser over there. Um, that's a pulsed laser, neodymium YAG, that's running at 532 nanometers. And uh, if you do everything just right, you uh, excite the dye and you get laser emission out of the dye, which can be anywhere from red to yellow. And we have an Arduino and Python set up so we can actually change the wavelength on the fly. So don't read this. Uh, this is really just to show you why we're interested in RBCA. There's a lot of rich physics going on, and as soon as we have these molecules, we're going to tap into that as well. Okay, switching gears completely. Uh, this was the ultra-cold side. Uh, switching now to the ultra-fast. How did that happen? Uh, sheer luck. So I got a donation of a picosecond pulse laser. Um, that's an industrial laser. You see it here. It's a time bandwidth duetto. That's this blue box. And then there's an amplifier module that's sitting here. And it came with chillers to keep it cool and the uh, necessary electronics. Um, it's a pulse laser. So instead of a continuous beam of laser light coming out, you have the laser light chopped up. 
and each of these little blocks of light is 10, is, is, yeah, 10 picoseconds uh, in duration. So that's 10 times 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So the question is, what do we do with it? And, uh, you know, at the end of a long day in the lab, what is more therapeutic than just holding some metal in that laser and just blasting a hole in that metal? <laughs> so that's what we did. And thank goodness there's physics attached to it. Uh, the technical term is laser ablation, uh, which is the removal of material with one of these pulsed lasers that is tightly focused down. And the technical term is large fluence. Uh, there's a lot of applications for it. And the ones I'm mostly interested in have to do with microstructuring surfaces. Uh, here are some examples of what people have done. Uh, these top two pieces here are different structures that you can inscribe on a surface just by moving your laser over the surface in a controlled way. Uh, this little bar here for reference is 100 micron, okay? so really microstructuring. And if you do it in, in a certain way, you can increase the friction. If you do it in a different way, you can decrease the friction. So if you're thinking of cutting tools, you want high friction. If you're thinking of moving parts, you want low friction. Um, what's even more interesting to me is what's shown in these photos over here. Uh, you can change the wettability of materials, which is how they react to water. So if you take some metal and some water droplet and you let it fall on that piece of metal, it'll just spread out, right? just as you see over here. But if you microstructure the surface, the water droplet actually will curl in on itself and will barely touch the metal surface. And the University of Rochester has a beautiful video where they show this microstructured surface and the water droplet falling onto the surface and bouncing off just like a trampoline. Okay. So imagine you do that to your cell phone. Right. That would be fantastic. You can toss it in the water, don't worry. So we're working towards this micromachining. Okay, uh, let me tell you a little bit about what laser ablation is, what the time scales are, what really happens. So your laser pulse hits the material, and as it hits the material, you emit a few electrons, a few ions, also a few neutral atoms, and those start forming a plasma plume above the surface. And then you can have a thing called inverse Bremsstrahlung heating, which is a three-body collision between one of these electrons, an ion in the plume, and another photon from the laser and that heats up this plasma. Now, in addition, you can have coupling between the plasma and the material, and that leads to the hole formation in the material, and it also leads to some melting in the material. Now, all of that happens on the order of a few 10 nanoseconds for a nanosecond laser. Now, after that, once you have this plume, the plasma plume expands, it cools down, and the electrons and ions can recombine and that gives you characteristic light emissions. Typical time scale for that is on the order of microseconds. Okay. And these two projects I'll tell you about in a moment, one of them looks essentially of what's left behind the material, and the other one looks at this light emission. So we actually got a second laser from the same company called the Mazama laser, which is very similar to the Duetto, but it's a lot more rugged, and the beam profile is much nicer. Uh, you see it over here, so it's a real industrial laser. Uh, the optical setup is very simple, essentially just a few mirrors, and we send it into this black box, which is shown over here from a slightly different angle. Uh, the black box is a scan lens, and that contains two mirrors, which are sitting on motors. So as you send your laser beam onto these two mirrors and you wiggle the motors, you can affect where the beam comes out of the scan lens. You can change the pointing. And then we have a big lens here which, call him, uh, which focuses the laser down to a tight spot. So we have full control over what the laser beam does, and we can, for instance, write whatever we want, ultra fast. Uh, we can also write any patterns we like. We send this beam onto the sample holder, which is shown in the top left, uh, that's sitting on translation stages, so we can position it nicely in the focus. And then in the bottom here, you see the laser in action. So this is a, what the cell phone camera made of the 1064 nanometers. Um, so you see the laser moving over the surface. And here you see a finished sample, uh, which is shown here on the left-hand side with a little close-up in a microscope. Uh, we use the laser to just write this grid pattern that you see and label the samples. And then the actual physics happens within each of these little grids so we know exactly what we did and where. 
And then we take these samples and we put them in the SEM, scanning electron microscope. And uh, so here's the very first sample we took last semester. You see the hole in the center. You also see quite a bit of melt around it. And you see this little uh, granular structure uh, that's material that has been recondensed on the surface. So what do we do with that? We're interested in brass this semester. And uh, there's been a 2013 paper where they looked at steel and copper and changed the polarization of this laser. And they used different linear polarizations, the horizontal and the vertical one. And in the case of steel, what you see is that the hole that is drilled by the laser is pretty elongated. And the long axis is always perpendicular to the laser polarization. But if you look at copper, that's not the case. Copper is nice and round all the way, independent of polarization. And the authors attribute that to the changing refractivity for these two polarizations. So the horizontal and vertical, uh, they're also called S and P polarizations here. Uh, for steel, the difference between them, especially for large angles, is about 60%. For copper, it's less than 10%. And if you picture something that has pretty much no difference, right, then it shouldn't affect your outcome at, at all. Right? So copper is nice and round, doesn't make a difference. Steel is elongated. So we started by sort of reproducing the data just to make sure our system is working as intended. Uh, we used steel as well. We didn't have the, a copper, so we used zinc. Um, both of these have relatively large differences, so we expected to see similar things. Um, in both of these columns, if you look on the right-hand side, this is where we used linear polarization. And you see the same effect that the hole is elongated perpendicular to the polarization. And then instead of just flipping the polarization, we used circularly polarized light. And because that's a lot more symmetric, we actually also get a lot more symmetric holes out of it. And then we looked at our brass sample. And the brass is completely unimpressed by the polarization. Right? It's nice and round all the way throughout, which is great, because it tells us this is one no less knob that we actually have to tweak uh, to get nice microstructuring. So we can put a check mark on that. Polarization doesn't matter. Um, we're currently looking into a wobble feature, which instead of taking the laser and sending it through in a straight path, you move it around on a circle or in some sort of elliptical path. And we took some preliminary data, and the holes look much, much nicer already. So that's definitely something we'll investigate next semester. And uh, then I found a stack of uh, metallic glass that a former colleague of mine just left behind. And we just held it in the laser beam, and there's some really interesting stuff happening. So I'm excited to look into that in more detail. So that's the ablation side um, that happens at these short, short time scales, uh, less than 20 nanoseconds or so. And now we'll transition into this LIBS regime, which happens uh, a few microseconds after the laser pulse. Now, you heard a little bit about LIBS yesterday, I think. Um, and it's a widely used technique. Uh, it's pretty robust and portable, portable enough so that actually the Mars rover has it as well. Um, you can find it in a lot of different areas, and it's really used for chemical analysis of uh, materials. And it's pretty much non-destructive. So you can tune the laser down significantly so that you're not destroying the object you're analyzing. The setup is also very simple. Uh, we use a laser pulse, and we focus it down with a lens onto our sample. Uh, in this case, this was brass again. And you see this little plasma plume form above the surface. So that's the light we're collecting. Uh, we then use a different lens, and we collect the light, send it uh, into a fiber, and send it to a spectrometer. And here's a close-up of the plasma plume. Uh, you can actually get a plume in air just by breakdown of air. And you want to avoid that when you take data, because it just adds extra noise, but it's nice to look at. Um, and then over here, again, this is brass. You see the plasma plume here, and you actually see some ablated material as well, which unfortunately in this image um, was happily settling down on our lens. So we started that project in earnest uh, less than a year ago, and our first spectrum is here on the left. Um, this was still pretty noisy, and it was difficult to see what exactly is going on. Um, we made some improvements, both in terms of the optics and of the electronics and control, and we got a much nicer spectrum where you can clearly identify um, the lines. And then I told you we're interested in brass, so here's the spectrum of brass. Uh, the biggest peak that you see here is at 532 nanometers, so that's just reflected laser light. 
but all of the other lines you see here are actual, uh, actual physical lines that we're interested in. And uh, we just started looking at these lines. Um, this is some data from the NIST database on copper and copper plus. And in particular, this region here, the 500 nanometer region, that corresponds to lines over here. So we just started mapping those. So is that going? Um, yeah, we looked at the uh, spectral lines that'll happen in a few weeks in more earnest. And uh, the next experiment will be to change the delay between when the laser hits the surface and when we actually record the spectrum. Um, so the LIPS regime is a few microseconds after. You can imagine if you record a spectrum here, you won't see many lines. And if you record it down here, you will not see many lines either. Okay. But by, if you do this very carefully, you can actually learn something about the physics that's going on there. And then we'll use one of the picosecond lasers to do LIPS as well. Uh, we set up some electronics for it last semester. Uh, the trigger pulse that comes out of the laser is this puny little sad thing. So we used the hex buffer to actually turn it into a nice trigger. And we used four decade counters to slow it down. Um, a decade counter counts only every 10th pulse. So if you have four in a row, you only count every 10,000th pulse. And that's slow enough for the spectrometer uh, to work. So I promised you 30 minutes. It's uh, almost 30. Uh, so big shout out to my research group. Uh, this was from last semester, 2016-17. Some of them have graduated. Um, I'd like to point out Shelby, who's actually over there. She's now a grad student here at the University of Arizona. Uh, Dane is here. He's working on the LIPS project. And uh, Otilia is here, and she's working on the ultra-fast, uh, ultra-cold, sorry, project. Uh, big thanks also to all the other students that have worked with me significantly. So these are the senior theses and the summer research students. And then, of course, big thanks to the funding agencies, uh, because without them, this would not be possible. And big thanks to you.